People look at YouTube automation sometimes the wrong way. They think it's get rich quick. Yeah, you're stealing videos from other creators. It doesn't work anymore to just do compilations. YouTube's more strict. They want transformative content. All the videos that go viral now are fresh content. This is something people really want to see, but no one is making content around it. You can make such bad videos around that subject, but people will still watch it because there's such a high demand for it. You're giving everyone the Yeah, basically, yeah, <laughs> I just gave it away. Noah Morris and Kayla Box run several YouTube channels raking in millions of dollars without ever stepping in front of a camera. Their secret? They come up with great video ideas for an underserved niche and then hire freelancers to make the videos for them. I can get someone for 50, 70 bucks to do this video and boom, you make thousands of dollars. So I sat down with them to learn their secrets so that you can do this too. Some people think you copy their title, you kind of copy their thumbnail and make it a little bit different and then you like recreate the video. Is that part of your guys' strategy? You gotta just press record. Basically, I have two of the biggest faceless YouTube channel creators. You guys are kind of known for faceless YouTube channels. I think of you guys first when it comes to it. One of my first questions was like, why YouTube? Why faceless channels? You guys have been doing it for a while. I guess, Caleb, like why the faceless route? I think it depends on everyone. Everyone's different though on goals. So I've met a lot of people, like we're at Vid Summit, I met a lot of people who are actual aspiring face talent. Like they want to show their face on camera. They want to be the talent. They love videos, right? Um, for, and I think even Noah could say so. We're more business oriented. You know, we're more here to make profit. You know, and not in a bad way, but you know, to make profit at the end of the day is more so. And so we don't care about the fame or the ego aspect of that. And so faceless is nice also because it's anonymous. You know, you see people like Mr. Beast. I knew him when he was only had 800,000 subscribers. He rarely would get stopped, even at Vid Summit in like 2019. Today, he he's not even around. He can't be walking out there because he knows he will get flocked and become a whole. It will become a hazard, honestly, at that point, right? And for him, he seems like he he's fine with that. The life, I don't want that life. I've never wanted that life. I don't really care for that level of fame. For me, I just enjoy making anonymous YouTube channels, entertaining people, and then making a profit at the end of the day. I, I think also another advantage that people really forget is that when you're a normal, normal creator, it takes a very long time to build interest in your own personal brand, right? Like um, they always say like it takes a long time to build up a personal brand and like seconds to break it back down. And the nice part about Faces channels really is that you don't really try to build interest around yourself, but you go to topics where there is existing interest and you attach yourself to that uh, topic. So you're very flexible and you're very dynamic. And that makes it also a very exciting business because you're constantly facing new challenges and new scenarios. And I think uh, some creators really burn out about the topic they're talking about. So yeah, you're always innovating, always trying new things, and um, you're very flexible in a lot of ways, yeah. I think another cool thing with faceless channels is that if you want to try something new, you're not really attached to it. You could start another channel and you guys have multiple channels, right? I think you said 20 yep. and you're running how many? I'm running seven personal. Seven personal channels. So personality channels versus faceless, like pros and cons. Do you think you can grow just as fast with the faceless channel? Um, as, as the same rate as a creator can? Yeah. Well, I think the market cap for a Faces channel is definitely smaller than a creator because people obviously naturally bond to characters and you don't really have a character on Faces channels. I do know that there are some um, Faces channels that emulate having a personality behind a channel, but uh, in general, like people resonate with characters better, so the market cap is a, a lot higher. Um, obviously, you have uh, channels like T-Series, but um, in general, the cap for Faces channels is a bit lower, but still big enough to be really, really large, yeah. yeah. I think when people first hear about faceless channels and they see how much you guys make, it like blows their mind and they can't comprehend like how you're making that much money off like these channels. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like what's realistic maybe for someone starting out to uh, how long does it take for them to start maybe making money and like what's the investment actually look like for someone wanting to get into this field? Basically, I think a lot of people really, really underestimate how long it takes. Like, yeah, you can run like faces channels with like maybe one day a week. If they are already making money, you have the team established, you have the idea and the format established. If that's the case, yeah, you can spend like maybe a day a week to run those faces channels. But um, it's like, uh, it's, it's faces channels, so it's still doing YouTube. Mm -hmm. And YouTube takes a long time to learn because you have to do so many different skills uh, and experiences you need to go through to really understand how the platform works and how a video really takes off. Right? You need to understand, okay, how do I make an engaging video? What does a good thumbnail look like? And that takes repetition and repetition. So I think people really underestimate how difficult it is, but it's a great business model uh, once those channels are running. So I would say, 
um, to get started, the uh, average uh, length I see, mm -hmm. uh, it's around, I think, six months to a year, really, uh, for most people. If you really um, go at it for like a year, you will probably be successful. I think a lot of people quit before they can even get successful. Like they think, oh, it's a get rich quick and they, I can do this for three months and I'll be making $10,000 a month. No, it's like just being a general, like a normal YouTuber without your face. So it still takes like a year of repetition and then you understand the format and you can repeat it uh, and, over. And I should also clarify, like during that one year, it's not making the same videos and getting zero views and keep doing it. What it is is figuring out sometimes you have to make uh, pivots into different niches or maybe a slight pivot in the topic because maybe the topic you're making no one actually wants to watch and maybe there's another topic that people really want to watch in your niche you know and so that's kind of what it is it's, it's just pivoting and making a few adjustments throughout and it sometimes takes that year before you finally make profit and start making extra money because you had to make those adjustments you guys have been doing YouTube for a very long time so you can like get channels up off the ground super quick and people out there watching this like they might have been doing YouTube but their personal channel is not making as much money. It's like they might be the perfect person to actually start a faceless channel and see success faster. Yeah, 100%. I think the guys, actually the biggest guys in the space, and I know um, you know a lot of the new faceless uh, crime channels, they're ran by actually people who used to run like normal YouTube channels and they um, got tired of like talking about finance or whatever they were making videos about and they blew up their faces YouTube channel and they were like, oh, like this really works. So like people who are established creators and have gone through that repetition of failing a video and understanding what a good video makes, yeah, they are usually the people to succeed really, really quickly. Yeah. yeah. You're developing skills. And it's like people people look at YouTube automation sometimes the wrong way. They think it's get rich quit quick. They hear faceless videos and they see the advertising. Unfortunately, like there there's like over four years of marketing that was just not the most transparent, I think. And so like Noah and I and a few others are trying to kind of erase that and put the right expectations going into this business model. But yeah, I mean, it's not get rich quick. And so you you have to be focused on developing the skills, not going into it solely for money, for, focus on the skills and the skills eventually the, the, the outcome of that is the money. That's really what it comes down to. I want to pull the curtain back on faceless channels because you said it has a bad rap. What are some misconceptions, Caleb, that you see yeah. when people get started, they're disappointed or like, like you said, they've been lied to or like it's different than what they thought? Yeah, so a long time ago, probably what, three years ago, at least is when it started. Um, There's people, even on TikTok, I think it started on TikTok. <laughs> it started on TikTok, there's random people. You know there's random people that says, here's how you make money from a multiple of different side hustles. A uh, few of them did a thing where they said you can re-upload uh, just rain noises, like rain, almost compilation videos. Videos, right, or even TikTok compilation videos that are teaching you to download other people's content, upload it without any edits, and boom, you make thousands of dollars. Now, the truth is, back when I was starting out in 2016, that was real. Back in the day, we started making a lot of money from water bottle flips. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but there was a trend water bottle flips where you try to get it to land, right? And that was a huge trend. And YouTube was not as strict about compilation, so you can monetize anything. So we did make a lot of money in that method, but today, YouTube's more strict. They want transformative content. They want it to be a little bit switched up. They want usually a narration on the content. So it doesn't work anymore to just do compilations. You have to be a little bit more creative with your content. Yeah, and I think uh, what happens a lot as well, is, and, and that's the most common criticism I hear, is like, yeah, you're stealing videos from other creators, uh, or um, it's not creative content, and that's a real, like that, that's a, one of the biggest um, argument people have for uh, against faceless channels. And I, I think they really underestimate how much time and work actually goes into these videos across our team members. Like, um, especially when you're running documentary channels, I run quite a few of those. Um, we run a channel about court, um, that it's called Court Cases. And like to produce one of those videos, it's like a few days of research to find the clips, find the news articles, find the right context. And then that's only the research part. Then there comes a script writer who just looks at all the research. It, they put it into one comprehensive story and then it needs to be voiced. That voice, um, sometimes they make mistakes so they have to go over and over. And then, um, and then the editor comes in and they really have to, you know, make it transformative and make sure, you know, there's a lot of context or educational context added. And that just makes it really transformative and fair use. Yeah, I, I would challenge some creators to try, try it yourself. Like try to recreate the content and see how long it really takes to make it. it it's really, um, some of these channels are really difficult to recreate. So um, there are some cases where it's super, like TikTok compilations, where it is not creative and those are those bad apples are definitely out there but in general like what we're talking about when we're talking about faces channels is like documentary and video essays and stuff like this really yeah so i've heard you say before like you know around 70 dollars to produce a video if you want to just go the automation route how much does it cost maybe to get a 
decent video that could take off in the yeah, algorithm. There's lots of factors. Yeah. So for example, how tapped is a niche? If a niche has been around for a while, there's a lot of competitors, you're gonna be fighting against those competitors. So typically that means your, the quality standards for that niche is now a little bit higher. So that means you have to spend a little bit of money. The second thing is how long is a video? If you're doing a five, seven minute video, $70 is a pretty reasonable budget. If you're in a, like I said, not too competitive of a niche. Okay. So, and Noah can speak more on this because he created a tool that literally finds niches for you. And so he knows when he sees a niche that's kind of untapped, he knows I can get someone for 50, 70 bucks to do this video. But eventually, and he'll probably mention it, eventually it will get tapped. And at that point, the budget might increase a little bit more. Yeah, this is a very common pattern where, you know, you start in a niche and you can get away with really bad quality content. So when I'm talking about a $70 video, I'm talking about like literally a, 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 a scriptwriter from Fiverr that's a very basic, like they probably copy paste stuff from Wikipedia and then a voiceover artist and um, that just does it really quickly, uh, takes them maybe 10 minutes and then the video editing is just like B-roll or stock footage. It can, it, in those niches you can definitely make some money but you have to be the first mover there and that first mover advantage goes away very, very quickly. So when we're talking about $70 videos, that's something that is getting into the past now like it's getting harder and harder to you know really compete with um with the rest on the yeah. 70 dollar budget but um if you have that first mover advantage it's certainly still possible we're actually doing it right now in a niche but um yeah you just have to um, think about 70 dollars is kind of the basis and it goes up from there but with the ai tools nowadays you can get a uh, ChatGPT script that takes you maybe like 20, 30 minutes to generate. Then uh, you can even monetize your videos if, with an AI voiceover, as long as the video editing and the scripting is really good. So you can then just spend $70 on a video editor, which is certainly possible. If you get a video editor from India or other local countries, you can definitely get a video editor for 70 bucks and actually get uh, decent quality on it if you just do the uh, voiceover and uh, script yourself. Yeah. Yeah, let's say you find a niche that typically you want to find something that you know a little bit about or you're passionate about. You know, for me, it was basketball, right? Basketball, though, there's a lot of competitors and there's people making amazing videos. And so I probably would not have succeeded if I just started with like a $50 video in that niche. Where would you suggest that they spend most of their money? Say they're willing to do a little bit of work. Maybe they have a little bit of editing skills or you know, they could maybe write the scripts, but they don't want to. Like where's, where are you gonna see the most bang for your buck? Is it an editor, a thumbnail artist? Curious what you think. So for, I think it just depends on your strengths. It's like, I have a lot of business mentors and they taught me that like, you gotta figure, everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. Some people might be good at writing, so that's your strength, write the script. Some people might be good at the narration, some people might be good at the editing. You gotta figure out what that strength is that you're willing to double down into and then you hire and delegate the rest. When I started out, I didn't have a lot of money obviously, so what I did is I learned the game of everything because I didn't have any money. So I had to learn editing, I had to learn the basics. It wasn't enough to get millions and millions of views, but it was enough to get a little bit of money in the door and proof of concept. Then I found a random friend in high school, I was like, hey man, I'll pay for your laptop, I'll buy your you know, camera or your microphone gear, and you just do it for 30% and I'll do the video idea and thumbnail. So we were like a partnership. So we did it, which was the best deal ever. And then what ended up happening is he was making all the videos for me for the most part. That ended up giving me a thousand bucks or so that I then, uh, per month, I was able to now hire a little bit more professional people on like Upwork.com or Fiverr.com. And I started obviously because I didn't want to lose all my money. So I had to start small. So I was really good at editing. So I, I sucked at script writing. I pretty much failed high school. So I was like, I need to get someone to take care of that for me. So I hired a script writer on Upwork for like 20 bucks to do everything for me. And she did a really great job. Sure enough, the retention went up, the views went up because of the quality. And I just, every little step until the entire thing was outsourced was like for me. So, you know, it's just, you got to start with what, what are you good at? Do you guys use AI to write scripts now? Is that like, where would you use AI in the process to help maybe save a little bit of money yeah. where it's still decent enough? Cause like if you had AI now and you were still in high school, yeah. Like you could have saved even more money because I, oh, yeah. I bet it probably would have been maybe even better than what you're I probably, was doing. yeah, I could have wrote the script myself probably now sure. with ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah. yeah ChatGPT is totally defined now. The, the, like, the more you move up the ladder, like, chat, like the scripts are the easiest to replace. Then the voiceover becomes a little bit harder because people still hear it's an AI voiceover, so they're less attached to the channel because they genuinely know there's no real person behind it. And then the video editing is still really tough. Like I would recommend staying away from AI generated videos at all. Like they're still really, really bad. Yeah, yeah they, they don't, I, I still have yet to find a tool that's really good for AI generated video. Yeah. Like, there's a lot more work there. If you had to put at the top of the list, like this is the most important aspect for YouTube when it comes to titles, thumbnails, ideas, editing, script, what's the like 
number one thing that you would say matters the most? I know that's such a hard question, probably even matters no, no, the most. No, no, that's easy one. What matters me. the most? Yeah, so um, if I can start all the way at the top, the most important thing is that you build your channel, if we're talking about mm -hmm. faces channels, sure. you build your channel around an area of like really high demand, low supply. That's the mm -hmm. formula that has worked for us both for years and it will always still true because YouTube is essentially a content market and each market has supply and demand. And it's just really important that if you're selling a faces channel and you, are, you have that flexibility to uh, uh, any niche that you want to essentially, it's really, really easy to just re do research, see what channels recently popped up and just started. And that's usually a really good indication of, okay, this is something people really want to see, but no one is making content around. And if you start your channel around that subject, that's the most important factor you can do. Like you can make such bad videos around that subject, but people will still watch it because there's such a high demand for it and no other supply. But as soon as you start going in the NBA niche or basketball niche, like, you have to compete with hundreds of other channels. Mm -hmm. And then you can't do that low quality video. Then you can't make those mistakes. You have to do everything perfect. And I think, especially for beginners, that niche is the most important step. And afterwards comes video ideas, packaging, and then the video itself. Uh, so it's a uh, reverse when it comes to uh, faces channels, really. My, what I usually teach clients who don't have a huge budget, because everyone's different. Some people work with me, they have a lots of cash. Some people don't have a lot of cash. Most people don't, right? So what I teach with that is sometimes when you don't have a lot of cash, you have to do what he said, which is you need to go into a low supply, high demand niche at the very beginning because it's the cheapest budget for videos, right? Now, is that going to be a long-term niche? Typically, it's not always the most long-term niche. It's not sometimes going to last three years. You know, if you want long-term consistent money, you usually have to pivot into more like bigger niches, like, I don't know, basketball, or there's a bunch of them, gaming. There's a lot of other ones. So what I usually do is I take the money from that niche, and now they have a lot more money, you know, 30, 40 grand, let's say, eventually. Now I can take that money, and I can play a little bit more risky moves and compete in a little bit more competitive market where the quality standards might be $150 a video because now I have the money for it, right? And then you start building a real brand, like a real faceless channel that has a, a brand and authority and everything. And there's a discussion that we had today, um, actually, with a guy named uh, Tommy Top5 Gaming, who's a very big, I think he has six million subscribers, one of the biggest uh, faceless gaming channels out there. And he even uh, wanted to ask us a question. He was like, why do you guys just not focus on one or two channels? Why do you do multiple channels, right? And we had this good debate about it, and, and both sides, I think, had their own points to it. And maybe you want to like touch on that. Yeah, so there's really two different different ways to approach this. Um, for me, I really love hopping from niche to niche. Um, so, so basically when you're speaking about faces channels, you're always thinking in modes. So you have multiple modes, and these are the three most prominent ones. You have a quality mode, which is what you are doing on basketball, like produce, uh, go into a niche, produce really high quality content, and then out-compete people based on quality. Then the second one you can do is the first movers advantage. This is what I love. Like I love um, going in, searching for those market opportunities, and entering in them. Like I think this would be the easiest one for beginners, because you don't have to know how to really make an amazing video. I think making amazing videos more, uh, more difficult than finding those opportunities. And then third uh, would be like a knowledge mode. Like for example, um, this is a good example. I, I recently shared one of my police body cam channels on my Twitter as well. And um, what you can do to create a knowledge mode there is, now it's not a knowledge mode anymore because people know it after this podcast, but <laughs> essentially what you can do there is you can, um, like all the videos that go viral now are fresh content. So what has been happening in that police body cam niche is people has, have been taking other uh, clips from YouTube and putting that in their compilation on their police body cam or their uh, documentary. And what happens then is people keep reusing the same and same clips. So audiences click on the video, see the same clip, they click off, and then your video dies out. But what you can do is you can submit FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Acts, to the sheriff officers, and you can pull fresh footage, and that's how you have a, a gap or a uh, moat on your competitors, essentially. So th this is what we call a knowledge mode. You're giving everyone the information. Yeah, basically, <laughs> yeah, I just gave it away. Yeah, so uh, it's fine. I'm selling the channels anyway, so because there's so much competition coming in. But yeah, if you wanted to stand out now in that niche, that's what you would be doing. Now it's not a moat anymore, uh, but... Uh, the principle makes sense though, because what you're saying, that makes a lot, of, like for me in the sports realm, like people have seen the top 10 plays of Steph Curry or whatever, right? And so it's like, you have to find, that's an interesting takeaway for me is like, people want to see new content. Right. And so whatever niche you're in, it's like, how can you stay on or create or somehow find new things that no one's ever seen before? And obviously that is going to 
um, make people want to watch that even more. Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. And, and it's a very interesting angle, for example. Yeah, just taking a different angle on the same topic could work really well. There's this one YouTuber who recently made uh, a really good um, video on the JFK assassination. It's called uh, Let Me Know, that channel. Okay. And um, it, there's a ton of videos, right, on the JFK assassination. But he um, did it specifically around, okay, where... Um, where the suspects around that time and uh, like this specific library on the road that JFK was assassinated and, and, and he just did it in such a unique perspective that um, that video did really really well while, while there are tons of videos on that subject he did really well because it's a fresh perspective and, and that's really what that knowledge or quality mode is yeah. about. The, the higher you want to go in the space the bigger you want to go you have to start figuring out new ways to provide something new to the market but I think also you got to figure out how to balance what already works. Sometimes people go too far and they try to reinvent everything, but that's also where you go wrong. Even to this day, Mr. Beast, you think, wow, it's the most unique ideas. It is, but some of the stuff that he has, the certain editing style, the certain thing he has was taken from other creators and he just combined it all into his own formula. So you just don't do too much of reinventing the wheel. You want to make sure you still have a little bit of what works in the, in the mix. Yeah, so actually, Mr. Beast, that might be an interesting topic to talk about as well. There was a video, Train versus Pit. That video idea has been taken from a faceless channel niche, which is mm. called BMNG. And those videos got millions and millions of views, like 60 million views a video. And that's where he took that from, because that came from the BMNG niche. And he took that idea and just put it on his own channel, because he knew that that has worked in the past. And essentially, he just took that and put that on his own channel. And that's what we do as well. We look at, OK, what has worked in the past, and how can we capitalize on it uh, in the present? If you're looking to get your first thousand subscribers or make your first $1,000 on YouTube, then join our free YouTube challenge that many other small creators have joined and seen tons of success. During this free challenge, Sean is going to share some of the best strategies for growing to your first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, as well as making your first $1,000. Just go to tubemonkeychallenge.com or check the link down in the description. So I want tips for someone watching this. They're ready to start their channel and they're like, maybe they already started and they're not getting views. One of the big things I hear you guys talk about is like, find what works, you know, this Mr. Beast example, like he found something that works and he made it his own, made it different, made it better. Yep. Is that still the best thing to do? You're saying don't reinvent the wheel, you know, find some research, find some videos out there that are doing well. Is that kind of like the best advice for someone is to not reinvent the wheel? I think it's a balance. Uh, like I said, like for me, at the very beginning, if I don't like, if I'm a beginner, I don't know YouTube. I see too many clients assume that they are better than the YouTubers who's been here for like, for like us for a long time. So like I give them advice, they're like, nah, but I think I should do it my own unique way. It's like, you just look at what's currently working, learn from them. So what I usually do is I can, there's a way you can take other people's scripts, not to use it, but to study it. So if you go to the actual specific video of your competitors, you can take the, there's a way to look at the transcript, like the captions, and you can actually copy all that, put it in a Google Doc, then you have to reformat it a little bit. Now you can put look it in at, chat GPT and it'll reformat it for you. Either that. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I do, yeah. But the thing is like what you can do is you can pretty much look at all of this, the script and I try to compare it with like three other of the scripts. I can see how they hook the viewer in, which is one of the most important parts. How do you make sure people don't just find the next video? You know, within the first 15, 30 seconds, you got to hook them in. So I will literally, me and my team, whenever we're about to walk into a brand new niche, we want to study what are they doing that we can do for ourselves. And if there's like patterns, we're looking for patterns. This is what Mr. Beast always does is that everybody I know on YouTube who's successful, they find patterns about across the board. If there's patterns in the script, we will try to do that and make sure we don't remove that part. If there's an area that isn't across multiple scripts, we're like, okay, maybe this is just extra fluff that they decide to add. Cool. That's optional. So that's how we kind of identify it. The same goes for thumbnails, et cetera. This is like those, that pattern identification, and this is why I love doing you know, the niche hopping, because I'm really, really good at identifying those patterns within, okay, what has worked and how can I... You basically uh, identify what's the core of what makes a video work, and then you think about, okay, how can I add one step onto that? How can I improve that 1%? And that's basically what you're doing is, if you're really good at that pattern identification, and actually a, a good tip is also for our normal YouTubers, um, go to your competitor, copy and paste all their most top performing videos, and ask ChatGTP what's the uh, what's a common pattern in the titles, or same thing you can do it in the transcript. What's a common pattern in the transcript, and come up based on that pattern, come up with like 30 new titles. And this is how I start in new niches. Like I look at the top performing competitors, I copy their titles, put it in ChatGTP, and then it will. Um, give me back all the patterns plus newly generated titles based on those patterns. Yep. Some people think that all you guys do is you go on YouTube, you find most popular videos, you copy their title, 
you kind of copy their thumbnail and make it a little bit different and then you like recreate the video, but that's not really what you guys are doing. And actually that doesn't really work, right? Like if you were to do that, it kind of goes back to like people have seen that before anyways. Yeah. How much are you looking at niches, uh, competitors in your own niche versus looking a little bit outside of your niche or maybe at like, yeah, and seeing what other people are doing to move it to your world yeah. and be like, that golf video is amazing. I think I can do that kind of in like an NBA realm. So, so sometimes we do, I do, I look at the most popular, I do see some videos where I'm like, okay, I could make another version of this, but I have to be careful because some niches, the trend is already dead. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people look at a viral video from someone's competitor, let's say, 12 months ago, viral video, 5 million views. Oh man, maybe I should do a similar title and thumbnail and everything, blah, 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 right? Like that's what they're saying on this podcast, right? But what they don't realize is maybe they got that 5 million views because they're talking about some trendy event that was 12 months ago and now nobody's talking about that trendy event. So you upload the video, you got 10 views, right? So you gotta make sure it's relevant to, to this, still to this day. There's a lot of news channels that report the exact same news. Phil DeFranco, so many others will report the exact same news on TikTok, et cetera, that's happening right now, but they still all get lots of views. So you know, there's a way where you can still talk about similar topics, but then at the same time, we're talking about also, you wanna be once in a while testing new topics at the same time. So I, I do a mix of the two. Right, yeah, yeah, I agree. What, what I often do is I really try to study, okay, what has done well in other niches with a similar format. So essentially you're not copying videos one-on-one, -on -one, you're copying formats. So um, this is uh, something I call uh, format uh, transferring, mm -hmm. which is you look at formats that do well in one niche and you copy it to a new niche because usually it works. So um, a good example would be, let's say documentaries do well, nearly well in every single niche. So what you can do is you search for a, a new topic, let's say um, golf, we'll just yeah. go work with golf. There aren't a lot of golf documentaries. Have you seen a lot of the golf documentaries? Not, not my browse feed. No, <laughs> exactly, right. So that's uh, what you can do is there are a lot of football documentaries, there are a lot of documentaries on film stars, celebrities, but there aren't a lot of um, documentaries mm -hmm. centered around golf. So what you do is you take that format, and, and format, I mean, the thumbnail, the title, the uh, way a video is structured, you take that and then you put, place it in a different context. And that's simply what you're doing. And that's, and that's what a lot of the top creators do. They just take that format and they put it in their own context. And um, so it's not, it's not really stealing, it's like stealing like an artist, basically. Do you guys think documentary, you know, those kind of videos, do you think they're doing well because they're lo really long form content? Is that part of your guys' strategy? Yeah, yeah, 20, I'm, I'm a big fan of very long form uh, content. It has been the meta for the last few months actually. I don't know if you've noticed, but longer videos actually uh, tend to perform better nowadays. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's pushing towards even longer videos. Why? Because YouTube obviously uh, compares videos of the same length. So eight minutes videos gets uh, compared to another eight minute video, and then a 10 minute video gets compared to a 10 minute video, and then a 20 minute video gets compared to a 20 minute video. So what happens if you make a, let's say a um, eight minute video, there's a ton of eight minute videos, right? Because it's easier to make a short video than a longer video. And as soon as you start moving up that ladder, let's say 20 minutes, there's less 20 minute videos than uh, to compare to. So it's easier to beat that competition in terms of uh, average view percentage, uh, also in terms of CTR. So you're, you're compared to a different uh, set of data that's easier to com uh, compete with. So that's why those longer videos are slowly uh, becoming a meta essentially, yeah. I still do this to this day, but um, I usually start smaller actually at the very beginning, but only for the ones who have less of a budget. Like if I'm consulting a client has less of a budget. For someone who has a lot more of a budget, then like he said, it's usually better if it works for the niche. Some niches aren't longer length, but a lot of them can make it figure out or make it work. Um, that's when we, if we have a bigger budget, because it costs more money the longer the length it is, that's when we can go a little bit longer length on the videos and everything. Um, but for beginners, I usually start with smaller length, like six, maybe eight minutes long, just because I know that in, if for beginners who have never done YouTube, they need repetition. So even if they have an 18 minute video, and even if the algorithm slightly performs a little bit more and pushes out a little bit more than a six minute video, the odds are it's still gonna be a really bad 18 minute video. And so they're gonna be losing a lot more money and you can get a little bit more repetition and more data at the very beginning on short length. Then when it gains momentum, then we increase the budget, we increase the length, and then that's when it really starts to exponentially grow because now you know the game. Yep, right. But another thing I wanted to add on to yeah. everything is, Again, length is another way to differentiate yourself from competitors. So it's again a, a mode you're creating when you're making those longer videos because you're also talking to a different audience. A really good example would be um, Daily Dose of Internet has like five minute videos, right? There are people that 
put daily dose of internet videos together in like one or two hour compilations and people put that on on their TVs while they're you know doing the dishes or whatever so that's a totally different audience you're talking to with those long longer videos so you're in a competitive market or in a very saturated market you would differ yourself with those longer form uh, videos essentially so that that's why they tend to perform better recently I want to know Caleb what do you think about YouTube shorts today is it worth doing for a faceless channel to grow faster, make money, like when should you use it, not use it, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So every person I talk to who's doing shorts as well on a big level, they don't even know the algorithm of shorts, they're just assuming things. Like with YouTube, I can look at certain videos, I can get a gauge of, okay, this is doing good, this is doing bad. Shorts, sometimes stuff takes off that like you don't understand. Like, you know what I mean? That's just very weird. They just test everything at that point. Um, the second thing is I look at shorts, like again, I look at YouTube first off as again, profit. Like I'm just trying to earn a little bit more money. That's my goal, right? So I'm not trying to be famous. I think a lot of people will get almost instant gratification because shorts are a little bit easier to go viral on. And so they're like, wow, I got, I, I, we've met so many people here where they're like, I'm doing 50 million. We got, actually there was one guy doing 150 million, 150 million views, some kid like 19 or something, 150 million views a month on, on YouTube. I'm like, oh my gosh. I was like, what's your channel? Like how, how much are you making off of that? He's like, oh, like 20 grand. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you, I'm like, so let me guess YouTube shorts. He's like, yeah, YouTube shorts. It's like, it's it's a weird world now because when I started out, it was obviously YouTube shorts wasn't a thing, TikTok wasn't a thing, right? And so obviously when you said views, you knew it was long form. So a lot of these guys though, they've tried to transition. They've tried to do long form and shorts on the same channel. And most of them, some of them get away with it, but most of them are not having success that I run into. And to me, that's bad because the long form pays the most, right? You can, put a you can make a little bit more money with brand deals. You can make a little bit more money with ad revenue. And the biggest one, is I always tell people right now, like actually ask yourself, YouTube shorts or TikTok, when, you, when what was the last person or last three TikToks you saw? Do you remember the person that you watched, the person's name? No. no. <laughs> All right. What about YouTube? Like the last three videos, can you remember the last three videos? One of them. Yeah, was part of it is because I watch a lot of the same creators too. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. But, right. Yeah. You're more memorable and you're more likely to be stopped in public more, right? If you have a long form, then you do short form. Another really interesting story I heard about um, long form versus short form is there was at VidCon, I don't know which year it was, there were two creators next to each other, one TikTok creator and then one long form creator that had like 10,000 subscribers, like 100,000 subscribers or something. So that uh, short form creator had 10 million followers on TikTok and then the uh, long form had 100,000. So what happened was they both did promotions on their channel. So he did promotions on his YouTube channel and she did promotions on her TikTok account. And then what ended up happening was no one showed up for that 10 million follower shorts creator. Oh, and then everyone showed up for that um, long form YouTuber. And that's really the difference. And I think mm. a lot of people think in a way like, why not do shorts? Instead of thinking, why do shorts? Because everything is about opportunity cost, essentially. Because if you spend like an hour a day, or I think most people spend more than that, yeah. like two, three hours a day on shorts, what if you invested those three hours in getting a brand deal or getting better um, long form videos? You will make exponentially more money from those than you know getting that instant gratification from all those short form views. Um, and that's why you know I don't think shorts, from a business perspective, is a good uh, move. Some people though, they see shorts as an opportunity to explode their channel and they're like, once I reach monetization or once I reach a certain level, then I will move over to long form. I have a buddy though who has a basketball channel, uh, you know, 100,000 subscribers, but it's all shorts. He's tried doing long form. He can't figure it out. He can't get any views. Right. I don't know, do you guys see that with people? Like, is that common? Nine out of 10, like there are some creators who get it right, like, but that's very rare. It's like nine out of 10 creators, they think like, oh, I have a really big short channel, so a few million subscribers, and they get 10,000. Why, why is that happening? Because um, I think pe people underestimate how different sometimes short form uh, viewers are from long form viewers. Because essentially long, uh, long form viewers, they have different attention spans to uh, common short users. Like common short users, they love like some people love shorts, some people love watching long form. So when you try to convert those shorts users to long form videos, they just don't like watching long form videos. Like they watch, uh, like watching short form videos. And so those are two different audiences you're catering to. Even though they like the same subject, they might only enjoy shorter form videos. So there's a big difference there sometimes. I think, I think your team, like Sean Cannell's team, you guys figured it out too. I think I saw a video a while ago that Sean uploaded breaking down the shorts metrics on the Think mm -hmm. Media podcast. Yeah. I think it came out, shorts was like younger demographic or something like that, right? And then the longer was a little bit older demographic. What was it? That sounds right. It's, but I don't think it was a crazy difference. I do think, I do think for sure it's a different audience. Cause like, even for yeah. me, I, I'm not on YouTube shorts. I don't scroll the shorts feed. Yeah. And when I do, I'm even like, I'm like, I just would rather watch long form. That's yeah. just me personally. 
Now, there is, I want to ask you about this, Caleb, because there's this new feature where there's um, a tag where you can click to link on your short form. You can click that, it takes you to the long form video. Do you think like there's hope in that? They're, they're obviously trying yeah. to get people from so, shorts to long form. I'll, I'll say my opinion. First off, I think that hurts retention based on what I tested, but I need more data. It's still new. But my theory on shorts, so I've been in the game of YouTube since like 2016, okay? So I've seen updates where they normally, YouTube would take sometimes a year on average to roll out a very basic update because YouTube wants to be safe before they roll it out to everybody. So what they do is they start with a pool of people, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they launch it to everybody. Shorts was one of the fastest things and features I've ever seen release from beta to public. The fastest I've ever seen they've ever done to, to, for, a, for a feature, which in my opinion is also the biggest feature they've ever launched for the platform. And my theory, and I don't f freaking know, but my theory, because I know that YouTube's a business at the end of the day, my theory is that TikTok was coming up at the time. TikTok was starting to take market share of YouTube. YouTube got scared, and so obviously investors are gonna be going down YouTube's throat. Hey, we have money in the stock market with Google, YouTube, whatever. You gotta figure out how you can take back market share. How are you gonna compete with TikTok who's just taking everyone over, right? So now they're like scared. They're, the executives have to figure something out ASAP to like gain market share back. And then they rushed out YouTube Shorts as fast as they could without giving it real data studies. Like we don't even know TikTok yet. We don't even know what's gonna happen to the average human viewer who watches 60 second content. What's gonna happen to the psyche of that type of viewer? We don't know that yet. So I don't know what's gonna happen to the future of content in general because of that. Another concern I would have is the profitability just for those platform, platforms. Yeah. I know, for example, Snapchat is losing tons of money on their um, snap shows. That's one. And then I'm pretty sure both TikTok and YouTube Shorts are barely profitable or unprofitable. I'm not 100% sure you should fact check me on this yeah, information. I think they should roll it away, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and that's the thing. There's just no room for ad placement. So how sustainable is Shorts as well? That's another question in the long term. But also another trend that you start seeing is that um, discoverability is becoming a really big thing, also on long form. So obviously, t TikTok is moving towards longer content, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, that has to do also with profitability for that platform. Same thing for YouTube. Um, they see, okay, TikTok is going towards longer content, so how do we compete now? Well, TikTok, you can discover new creators super quickly, right? It serves uh, new creators in a really uh, fast manner. So what YouTube now has to do is they have to make uh, or boost newer channels really quickly so newer channels or fresher content can thrive on the platform. So what's happening, uh, usually when you start a channel, there's this thing called the, like a starter boost, that's usually what I call it. Your channel takes off really quickly and then it plateaus really quickly as well. You'll literally see like an exponential graph and then it just dies out like this. It, uh, it looks very similar to a, a short form graph actually. You know how in the past like long form would like gradually go up and like shorts would shoot up and then die out. That's now happening to long form videos as, a, as well just to boost that For new channels. Yeah, for new channels, yeah. Interesting, and so let's talk about more about that for a second because that's like, that seems like a huge opportunity for people yeah. to yeah, jump yeah, into yeah, this yeah. space if Cause I feel like I've seen that too. And going back to like Steph on our team, right? Like he's seeing traction on his brand new channel, like started with zero subscribers and is getting thousands of views. Yep. If those videos start to die off, like what advice would you give him to continue to like, are, are you seeing, cause it could just be, he has a great video, great thumbnail, but how much of it is it just YouTube giving views versus great content? It's natural actually. Um, this happens quite a lot. Like we have a lot of channels that blow up like 200, 300K on the uh, first video. And then you upload a few more videos and the videos just die out. Like it doesn't work. You have to get through this throw through like, a, like a, a mode. And then the videos start uh, gradually performing better. So YouTube pushes it really aggressively in the first two, three videos. And then the channel dies off. And then you have to consistently keep uploading. And then gradually the views will start coming back. And I think you've experienced uh, multiple, times. Yeah, yeah. multiple times. Yeah, multiple times. I've been well. starting a lot of new channels. I keep running into it where it'll spike up. You're like, oh my gosh, we're doing it again one weekend. And then it'll die out. Like, okay, maybe it'll come come back like you just got to give it time and keep pushing through all right so yeah if you look at the uh, videos right here the first video got 217k views like we saw all these Somali pirate wow. videos doing really yeah. well so we just like okay how can we improve the thumbnails a bit and then we did the same video and that first one blew up like it's super easy to blow up these channels but then what happens is you see the second video does well the third video does meh and then it just starts dying out you see this pattern it's probably the same as on his channel as well where those first three videos really explode and then it dies off so 
usually to fix this, it's, uh, it's a very new problem that's been arising and that's exactly to do with that discoverability where they push you really hard at the start and then it dies off a bit. So you have to then start tweaking it and, and try and get it to start up again. And after you've gone through that valley, it will usually start uh, seeing some more consistent growth afterwards. So yeah, that's uh, one of the challenges. Yeah, let's talk briefly on like uh, avoiding copyright issues or like I've had a couple show up on mine. I think there's just, there's, YouTube just scans your videos, right? So like sometimes automatically it's like, oh, this is owned and then I dispute it and then I'll be like, okay, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, briefly, I think people, you know, obviously, you know, this is not like legal advice. Yeah. But like, yes, yes, yes. We're gonna need to get Devin Stone in here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but you know, you use fair use, yeah. and so um, I, I think, and there's videos on it and stuff. But I don't know if you wanted to add any tips for yeah. that. Your video or the video itself you're creating has to be way more valuable than that one clip you're inputting in the video. That that one clip is just for a small bit of context on a uh, very big picture, essentially. So um, yeah, you can't use like, for example, one. Uh, clip or one video and cut it up and then spread it out throughout the video because then you're using too much of one source. What you want to do is get multiple right. sources. You want to make sure that there, yeah, there's interval, that uh, interval between commentary and actual uh, clips. And then you want to make sure that you're adding a storyline or uh, educational uh, content to it. That usually really helps with arguing for fair use. Uh, another thing would do be very careful where you get the footage from. Usually movies, TV shows, um, ads, cr or creative works, you usually call them. Those are very dangerous. Together with sports broadcasts, you might know that yourself. And there's, by the way, there's some though that do allow it. This is why yeah. it's, it's like it's like a game sometimes because you just gotta you gotta be testing like look into some of them have like public licensing agreements that you can either buy or they have a public domain licensing. I know Marvel. I don't know if it still is this way, but back in the day, my Marvel channel, Marvel wanted people to be talking about their footage, to be showing the footage, not to show it as like a full length, but be using yeah. it in the background because they wanted fans to hype up the next movie. Some movies want it to happen, but some don't. So you just gotta be careful on that one. Yeah. That that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I've had a few like copyright claims and it's if no one's ever experienced this, basically you know it's like hey copyright claim you can go into youtube studio dispute it and basically just explain why it's fair use that's yeah. all i did and mm -hmm. i just explained why it's that fair works. use yeah. and um it's come back every time for me like because right. i truly am transforming new content yeah, right. and so if you are doing that then um there's really nothing to worry about what, and, and what i've done on scale like what you're gonna have to do on scale eventually like that's gonna be a thing where someone's gonna falsely copyright strike you i'll give you an example or copyright claim Aiden Ross, for example, we made a video breaking down like some, some gang violence that was going on. It was very customized. We found multiple sources of clips. There's nothing copyrighted about it, right? We transformed, we made amazing commentary about some gang violence. Aiden Ross went live, and then he decided to watch it as a reaction video. I'm okay with that. He did a reaction video, obviously, that gave us a little bit more views. But then his team, which there was a whole controversy, his team then copyright, uh, copyright claimed, and actually, I think they copyright strike, copyright striked my video. So then oh, no. that way they claimed that his was the original, but he was the reaction of the video that was already published. In that situation, when you're on scale, when you're making lots of money, you need to have a full-time attorney. I have a full-time attorney. We sent them a whole cease and desist. It was a whole thing. And then they immediately removed it because they know they're in actual court. It would be a whole mess. And so you sometimes have to defend yourself. There's people that would try to game the system. It happens all the time. And that's when on scale you need to have an attorney like, ready to go. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, if you're scaling up, you're going to need legal support. Well, what you guys are doing is super inspiring for me to like see what's possible with YouTube and faceless channels. And so I, I look up to what you guys are doing, what you're building. If you were to talk to that person who, you know, you put yourself in the shoes, like you have nothing now and you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a YouTube channel. What would be, what would you tell Noah? What advice would you give the person just getting started today? Right, uh, especially if you have a smaller budget, just take it slow. Uh, like, the things are opportunities or YouTube is not gonna run away from you. Like, faces channels or faces content will exist, I think, for the next two, three years minimum. Like, except if YouTube makes some radical change all of a sudden, we'll be fine. Let's hope. <laughs> like, like YouTube shorts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, but so let's hope that that doesn't happen. But I don't see that happening anytime soon because then they have to enforce it for all the faces channels and that becomes a real mess. So um, yeah, what I would do first is just take your due diligence with researching everything. Try and practice uh, video editing, script writing, studying thumbnails. You don't have to spend any money, like nothing. You can just start studying, that's it. Because the studying is what takes the most time. Yeah. And I think the, study, the studying period and people then also starting to upload videos, that's where people lose money. If you would study, 
become like very knowledgeable on YouTube and then start spending money on producing videos, that's how you avoid losing any money because then you have all the, that knowledge up front and the chances that you succeed is like infinitely higher than if you just start straight away without studying first. Love that. Well, what would you ever say, Caleb? I mean, we do the same game, so I mean, <laughs> he's got it locked in. <laughs>